the Portland Community College Mathematics Telecourse, a course in arithmetic review, produced at Portland Community College. numbers and more numbers and yet more numbers they're all about us in our job every day in our talk from hour to hour numbers in this lesson we're going to look at the pieces in the structure of numbers. And in the next few lessons, we're going to tear numbers apart and put them back together, very much as a mechanic would tear a carburetor apart, inspect it, put it back together, so that in the new version, it works better than before. We're going to look more intimately at the question, what is our system for writing and saying numbers? After all, they could have been written differently. Let's look at the way we have traditionally written them in great detail. You're all aware that with just these 10 marks, we can, in fact, identify, compute, and talk about billions upon billions of different numbers, an infinite set of numbers. How did our ancestors structure a system whereas just with these 10 symbols, we can say an infinite number of things, an inf infinite number of ideas, which over the centuries have moved us into the space age. Already, Within just a few sentences, we've begun to build a technical vocabulary, which to start with will seem very simple, but as we build with these very simple tools, ultimately we will build a very comprehensive and in fact an awe-inspiring system of thought. Digits. Digits is simply the name we will apply to those 10 basic marks. The symbols for the 10 basic numbers with which we will use to structure the entirety of our number system. Digits, that's also the word for this, finger. And of course, that's where we started counting. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. In fact, in many ancient language, the word 10 was simply the plural for two hands. So hands meant 10. You will begin to recall that by writing a digit in a certain place changes its values. So we not only have the digit value, 0 through 9, but we have the place value where that digit is written. To write a digit here is to say that we've written it in the tens place. To write a digit here is to say that we've written it in the hundreds place and here in the thousands place and here in our ones place. So we have a place value. A value that is not only determined by what digits you use but where you place that number in a linear string. See, our digits are the numbers for our fingers on which we first counted. And now we place the digits in a specific place and we change its value, hence place value. But there's more to it than that. We not only learned 10 digit names and the names for separate places, the ones place, the tens place, and the hundreds place, but 
we also chose, or our ancestors chose, to name groupings, groupings of three. The first group of three they called the units group, and the next group of three, the thousands group, and the next group of three, the millions group, and the next we called billions. So our number system has three segments to it. The name of the pieces, ten of them, digits. The name of places, at least three places, the ones place, tens place, hundreds place. Then in groups of three, the units, thousands, millions, billions, and if we were to go on there'd be trillions and quadrillions, which we won't worry about just yet. This total structure we will call the place value system. And here in the United States, to keep our groups of three visually separate from each other, we use commas. Those of you who might have traveled in Europe, you'll realize they have slightly, a slightly different system and a slightly different naming system. Our millions is not their millions. So one must be cautious when speaking to people from other culture. This is not the only system. There are other systems, as those of you who will move into computer applications will find very soon. This lesson, then, just wants you to get used to reading numbers, both by words and by our place value system. So when you're reading a whole number, you simply first mentally or visually divide it into groups of three. Then think of the number in terms of the group of three and its group num name. More specific, let's view the number within this context. We had 32,506,078. So to read a number, all you need to do is read in groups of hundreds and then repeat a group name, 32 million. 506,078 period units. Notice how we had to use that zero. Without that zero, a person could write the seven over here and the eight over here, then that would be 780. So these placeholder zeros are important to tell us in this case there are no hundreds, just seven tens, eight ones. 32 million. 506,078, and we have our number. Note, I did not say and between here. That's a very common error. Do not say and towards the end. Go through very smoothly. Therefore, in this course, we will refer to this way of writing a number as the place value name, where we use the digits in com combination with their places to express the totality of the number. Now, when you say it aloud, 20,356, or you write it in long words, we refer to that as the word name. So word means literally that. How do you say it with words as opposed to to the digits in their places, which we call the place value name. So place value name, word name. Keep those two terminologies separate from each other as we talk in the future. Using the analogy of a mechanic, not only must he know what a carburetor is if he's to repair it, he must know the names of the parts of that carburetor, whereas you and I as drivers do not. But we're about to become mechanics of numbers. So we must not only know that this whole number is called a place value name, but we must know the names of the pieces of this number. Of course, that piece there we call a digit 2. That piece there is a digit 3, the digit 5, and the digit 6. 
But sometimes we want to talk about the place the digit is occupying and not the digit that's there. So the 2 is occupying a place. The place has a value of ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands. So the place value of the 2 is 10,000, whether I say it that way or whether I say it this way. So place value is a phrase we will use when we want to know the value of the spot at which a digit is sitting. The digit itself will have nothing to do with it. Now, before we conclude, let's have a running review over these new terminologies. The word digit applies to just these 10 symbols. Then the names of places, ones, tens, hundreds. Then the names of the number groupings, units, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, etc. Then using the digits in the place, we call that kind of an expression a place value name. Then actually verbalizing it, we call a word name. Same number, just different words to express different ways of saying or writing that number. Then sometimes we'll want to concentrate on the spot at which a digit is, and we call that the place value of that digit location. That's it. Mostly it's all words. But in the future, things get very specific. Learn them so that with them, complicated ideas can be made simple. At first, because of similarity of phrasing, when reading a math statement, one must be particularly cautious to read every single word. For instance, here we're going to ask for the place value name of a number, and here we're asking for simply the place value of a spot occupied by the seventh digit. So here, the lack of having this one additional word we're asking for two entirely different things. So if we gave you a number like this in word name, we're simply saying, OK, we've stated a number with words. Now state it using those digits and placement of digits, which together we call the place value name of that entire number. So here we have 1,000. 740, 740. So this entire way of writing this one large number we call the place value name. If, however, you were given this number written in this form, the place value name form, and you were asked, what is the place value, and it stops, of the sevens digit? So we find the sevens digit, and we ask ourselves, irregardless of what's in this spot, what's the name of the spot itself? So that's the unit spot, or ones, ten spot, hundred spot. So in answer to this question, what is the place value of the sevens digit, we would have to say the place value is hundred, or one hundred. You see the difference between the question place value and the question place value name. This is asking us to name an entire number. This question is saying what's the place value period of a particular spot. That spot occupied in this case by a sevens digit. So read very, very careful on this lesson to be clear when we're talking about a name of an entire number and when we simply want a value of a particular location or place. Of course, we express ourselves in these two different ways every time we write a check. Let's say we've gone to our corner store and we purchased $205 
worth of grocery. So in writing a check, we're going to write the name of the store. Then in this location, we write the value of our groceries in place value name, $205. Then we write it again over here in word name, $205 and no one hundredths or no cents. So every time we write a check, we in fact are utilizing this lesson, aren't we? First we write the value of the check in place value name, then we write the same number again with its word name. And for a check to be proper, and processable, these two must agree. Hence the importance of this particular lesson, because this economy nowadays almost rides on checks and paper money. You see, many thousands of years ago, before our ancestors had a written language, or possibly even an abstract thinking or speaking language, they would keep track of how many of an item over a long period of time, perhaps with pebbles, or in this case, with berries. So perhaps these, the small handful of berries, would stand for the fact that this hunter had noted what we now know of as eight antelope. But not having the idea of eightness, he would simply put aside a pebble for each antelope that he noted and then back at his encampment, this could be a way of illustrating the not yet born idea of how many antelope he had encountered. Then for small numbers, of course, we would just count on a hand or two hands. But we couldn't keep our hands in this position forever, hence the pebbles allowed us to free our hands and it formed a memory which preceded the written symbol, which came actually many, many thousands of years after the use of that. Between this and this, because you can imagine what, how many berries I would have to have for a number like that, and we would lose all concept of how many for the simple thinking that we had in those days, that between the pebbles and the number, came a development called an abacus, or if you would, a beadboard that perhaps all of you have encountered in your elementary school days. This actually was a sort of an efficient system of pebbles. After a person had counted out what we now know of as eight objects, for each finger on his hand, or for each antelope, or for each pebble, he would bring down one of these beads until he had eight beads down. So pretty soon these beads in this first row begin to stand for fingers, and hence we call it the units or the digits column. So if later on the trail he saw another antelope, then he would simply put one more bead. If he saw yet another one, then another bead. So he has this many beads, which translating back to his fingers would become one set of hands. Now on our hands we run out of fingers, but on the bead board or pile of rocks we could keep this going as far as possible. But somewhere in our progress we came upon the idea that since I run out of fingers at 10, if I get 10 beads, then if we get more than 10 beads, for each 10 beads or one set of hands, let's put those back and put one over here. So this bead was counting the number of antelope, two of them. This bead does not st stand for an antelope, it stands for a hands of antelopes, if you would. So this bead says count up one completed set of hands, which we now of as tens, and now two more, what we now know of as 12 antelope. So if there were two here, and let's say four here, 
this says, this first bead, count out a complete set of hands. We've done that. This is becoming an instruction, isn't it? This says count out another set of hands. Now after we've counted off two hands, which we now know of as 20, then this says count off four fingers or four antelopes. Hence, we now have 24. So you can see when we talk about place value, each bead here stands for a set of hands rather than a single item, in this case, antelope. So hands became the place value, or 10. Well, that idea caught on. If when I get 10 beads here, I throw it back and put one over here, then perhaps I will reach the point where I have many, many hands. So man began to abstract. He had the notion now, whenever I get 10 here, let's also throw that away and put one over here. So here we have what we now call 10 beads, which were in those days hands of beads. So one set of hands of beads becomes one over here. So this is no longer hands, is it? This is sort of hands of hands. And of course, we now know each of these is 10 of these, and 10 of these now with our sophisticated thinking is the 100's place, then 1,000's place, then of course the 1's place. So if we had a number like this on our counting board, This says I have two items, each worth 1,000. One item, each worth 100. Four items, each worth 10. Two items, each worth 1. So we have now in our modern symbology the number 2,000, 100, four tens, which we now call 42. So can you see when we said place value name, we meant that literally. It's hard to imagine that our ancestors never could conceive of this as one large number. This was simply a code. It simply meant I have two beads here, four beads here, one bead here, and two beads here. How many of this, all we could do is shrug our shoulders. This would mean count off one item, count off one more item. Now this means set up your hands to do some counting. Or we learned eventually for each one of these, that becomes 10 over here. So can you see one going back here becomes 10 over here. So can you see where our idea of borrowing came from? And the same thing here. One here was 10 over here. So we begin to get the abstract idea that one bead here is worth 10 of these. One bead worth here is worth 10 of these. One of these is worth 10 of these. Or 10 here becomes one over here. 10 here becomes one over here. So we're beginning to see a system and man is beginning to abstract. So if you'll keep a mental picture of this abacus in mind as we proceed through the next few lessons, you will see through it why we do many of the things we now do with our place value numbers. To our ancients, this simply meant not the number 234 as we now know it, but two beads in this place three beads in this place, and four beads in this place. And if we now want to add this number to the ancients, this was not adding another number, this is simply an instruction saying put two more beads in this place. Put one more bead in this place put one more bead in this place. Now, tell me,
how many total beads I have in each place. So I have three beads here, counting. I have four beads here, counting. I have six beads here, which we have learned to call the sum of these. But our ancients weren't adding numbers. They were simply placing in more beads than what we now call our sum, our sum answer, was nothing more than counting off the results after I had placed in additional beads. So this placing in of beads and counting off the new totals, we now replace by a mental process of thinking and call addition of numbers in place value system. So to our ancestors, once again, this was not a number. It was simply a description of what was happening on this bead frame. So our description says, in this column, we have five beads. In this place column, we have six beads. And in this place, we have three beads. And we, many thousands of years or later, have learned to call this one number 365. So if we had instructions which asked us to take three beads away from this column, two beads away from this column, and one bead away from this column, and we want a symbol for that instructions of taking these beads away, which we now have in this symbol, we would have left two beads here, four beads here, and two beads here. So you begin to see where our subtraction came from, too, don't you? And if you think and play with this a little bit, you can begin to see where the idea of borrowing came from in subtraction and carrying came from in addition, when we realize every time I get 10 here, it disappears and becomes one over here. But if I need more beads here, I can put one away, which becomes 10 over here. This has been presented to you rather rapidly, just to give you a feel that what we do with our numbers is really a symbolic representation of what we used to do in our not too far distant past with beads on a bead frame called an abacus. So we've gone from rocks and hands to an abacus to a place value name, and now with our written language, our modern day word name. We work with these, we communicate and speak with these. So this lesson is just to get you used to and more precise with our system of writing numbers. That's all. So in the next lesson, we'll begin to look at this structure a little bit more closely. So this is your host, Bob Fennell, saying we'll see you then.